should be back. Then take your Bibles, turn to Galatians chapter 5, and we have been looking at this matter of revival all month. We talked about a heart for revival. That is our hearts in love with God, desiring uh, His best. Secondly, we talked about the spirit of revival. That is the Holy Spirit craving Him, desiring Him, open to His influence in our lives. And this week we're going to talk about the habits for revival that matter. Because revival, while revival is something that God sends... It's something that we can prepare our hearts for so that we are ready when it arrives. And that's why we read as our scripture reading this morning, Philippians chapter 1 and verse 19, it talks about having the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, which is something that we all need. So Galatians chapter 5, we're going to look at some of these habits that matter. Now, this is a, a, a type of message type of sermon that I don't usually preach because it has a really, really long introduction and then a short couple of points at the end. There was a fella at my uh, Bible college, he was one of the staff, and so he often preached in chapel. His name was uh, Bill Behrens. I don't know if you ever heard him preach, but he was one of these fellas. You'd give him 45 minutes to preach. He'd have about a 40-minute introduction. And then he'd look up at the clock and realize he just had about five minutes left. And he'd say, okay, let me give you my main points, and he'd give you four or five main points. And we always really enjoyed his messages because he had these really long introductions that were fascinating introductions, but uh, had very little to do with the preaching. I don't want to do that to you this morning. The introduction is, is part of our message. Let's pray and then we'll get into this. Father in heaven, again, we recognize that we need that supply of your spirit if we are going to be successful Christians, if we're going to bring glory and honor to you. And that's our desire. And you know, Holy Father, that our nation is making it more and more difficult to serve you in the way that we desire to do. Father, it feels as if the current is growing ever stronger and swimming upstream becomes more and more tiring. But we're thankful that you do not call us to serve you by our own power, we know that we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of you and not of us. So we ask that this morning as we think about how we can prepare our hearts for revival, what we can do, what changes need to be made, that you'd open our eyes to this truth that the power is from you. We also ask that we could focus, that we would not be distracted by the events of this week, by anything that goes on in our service. We're thankful that we've had a chance to lift our voices in gratitude and praise to you because you are worthy. And so we pray these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now I mentioned that we cannot make God send us a revival. A revival is His timing and a revival is His power. But what we can do is we can prepare our hearts and order our lives and focus our thinking so that we are ready for revival. There are three things that we're going to want to prepare our hearts, order our lives, and focus our thinking in order to accomplish. The first thing we want to do is glorify God, isn't it? What does 1 Corinthians 10.31 say? Whether therefore ye eat or drink, do all to the glory of God. So we want to prepare our hearts order our lives, and focus our thinking so that God is glorified. One man said, Every successful person I have heard of has done the best he could with the conditions as he found them and not waited for next year for better. I was just talking with my neighbor yesterday and we both agreed that we we're going to remember 2020 for a long time. There's all the excuses that any one of us could want to put off serving God, to put off glorifying God until next year. Certainly 2021 has to be better than 2020. We've had fires, we've had pandemics, we've had recessions, we've had impeachment. I mean, all these crazy things that we've had. But now is the time to prepare our hearts and order our lives and focus our thinking on glorifying God and not be focused on what our circumstances are. 
I can give you a list of excuses for why you aren't ready today to serve the Lord. Why you're not ready today to bring glory to Him. Maybe, maybe some of you say, well, listen, I'm really busy right now. The truth is, every good person I know is busy with something. Now, they may not be getting paid for it, but they're still busy. After my dad retired, I don't know, it was about a year later, I called up there and I asked to talk to him and he was gone doing something. And I said to my mom, boy, he seems as busy now as when he was working. And she said, yeah, he's just as busy. He doesn't get paid for it anymore. And, uh, you know, he helps at his church. He helps neighbors. He works around his own house. He comes down, he helps me. The most recent project was my brother in Alaska was selling his house. So he was over there. My dad was over there preparing his house for sale. I mean, the man is busy. He just doesn't get paid for it. And so my, my point to you is you're never going to be not busy so that you can serve the Lord. You're always going to be busy. Some of you may say, well, I, I'm not married yet, so I'm, I'm not ready to glorify God. I, I want to get married first. Or I'm not ready to glorify God. I've got little kids. Or I'm not ready to glorify the Lord. I've got teenagers. Or I've got grandchildren. There's, no matter what stage you are in life, you can use that as an excuse. But God, we want God to be glorified regardless of our circumstances. Here's my favorite. You may not be catching this, but I have friends all over the United States, and some of them are reaching out to me, calls, texts, emails to say, how are you doing in California? We hear it's really bad out there. Now, part of it is the bad, you know, the fires and the smoke and that, and I get it. Part of it is the government. They understand that churches in California have been fined or threatened with fines for meeting, and, and they're serious. They're not being silly. You know, uh, we, we have a guy, he's supposed to come, a friend of mine, Pastor Steve Dameron, he's going to be with us on August 11th, and his office reached out to me uh, this week and said, are you still planning to have him? I said, if he's still planning to come, you know, wouldn't it be nice if the police came on August 11th and arrested him instead of me? And then I'd say, oh, I'm so sorry, I had you out here, brother, and you know, Bad timing, you know. Maybe one of you should call. Guillermo, you've got a friend with the sheriff. Maybe call and have him show up on that Sunday. Now, seriously, seriously. We can all use the excuse, but we live in California. Listen, God isn't interested in our excuses because the power is of God. Amen. It's not of me. You know, if I had to glorify God in my own strength, I would be a miserable failure. Right. But the power is of God. So God is glorified. We want to... Uh, prepare our hearts and order our lives and focus our thinking so that God is glorified regardless of our circumstances. But secondly, prepare our hearts, order our lives, focus our thinking so that when revival comes, we are ready for it. I want to be, I want to be the vanguard of this revival. I want to be the tip of the spear. I don't want to be in the back. Oh, those people are having revival. Let's go find out what's going on. I want to be, I want to notice when this, when the spirit begins to move. I want to notice when other Christians get energized. I want to be a part of that group that is excited about what God's going to do in 2020, what God's going to do in 2021 in California. So I'm going to prepare my heart and order my life and focus my thinking so that I'm ready for that. But here's the third thing when it comes to, um, habits of life and preparing our hearts, ordering our lives, focus our thinking. I've had, as I talk about revival, not so much this month, but in the past, as I've talked about revival, I've had brothers come to me and say, Christian brothers come to me and say, you know, pastor, don't you think we're in the last days? Don't you think this is an age of apostasy? And it would be it's just, it's not the time for revival. It, it's a time of a, a turning away from the Lord. And the implied statement is, therefore, let's not look for revival. Well, I say to that, I say, okay, we're in the last days. We're in the age of apostasy. So what do we do? Do we give up and go home and watch Benny Hinn? I'm being serious. I mean, what, what, if this is the last days, if we're in a time of apostasy, by the way, no one knows when Jesus will come. I was reading a preacher from the early 1900s who was expecting Jesus to come in his lifetime. He's dead now. But we should be waiting because the Bible says watch. Amen. So I don't blame him for waiting 100 years ago. I'm just pointing out to you, we've, we've been in the last days for several centuries now. 
What do we do? Do we just give up? No, I want to be running the race until the very day that Jesus comes. Jesse encouraged us with his own testimony. If we knew Jesus was coming at the end of this week, would we live Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, any differently? That's what he asked us. I hope not. I hope, I hope every day we're trying to use it up so that God is glorified, so that I'm ready for revival, so that the Holy Spirit can work through me. Because it would be, it would be a tragedy for Jesus to come and me to be just sitting around the house eating potato chips. So we want to run the race right up until the day that Jesus comes. So let me tell you now what I think the trouble in America is so that you, as I am, are motivated, are, are, are thinking about how do I prepare my heart? How do I order my life? How do I focus my thinking so that God is glorified? The problem in the United States is that we have unbelievers who are scornful of Christianity because we are spiritual weaklings. You may be familiar. If you're not, you don't need to go find out. But just this, this week, the last two weeks, there's been a scandal at uh, Liberty University, and just yesterday I, was, yesterday I was talking with a man who's an unbeliever by his own admission. He doesn't, he's not a Christian. He's an unbeliever. And he basically said, but you Christians are like Jerry Falwell. And you know what I wanted to say? <laughs> I am not like Jerry Falwell. But, but the truth is, we get lumped in together with other people who are not necessarily the same as we are. Now, I'm not terribly worried about that. You say, what are you going to do? You know, I didn't need to respond to that because that man is not going to get saved until the Holy Spirit convicts him of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. So we just moved past that and we talked about whether he was a sinner or not. That's the question. Amen. I'm a sinner. Jerry Falwell is definitely a sinner. I mean, we're all sinners. That's not the issue. But wouldn't it be different? Wouldn't it be, excuse me, wouldn't it be better if Christians had different marriages because they had the power of the Holy Spirit? Wouldn't it be better if Christians had a different work ethic because we had the power of the Holy Spirit? Wouldn't it be better if Christians had different speech because of the Holy Spirit? Wouldn't it be better if Christians had different goals than the unsaved because of the Holy Spirit? I mean, if all you ever talk about at work is, boy, I've just got five or six more years and I can retire. You know what your coworkers think is most important to you? Your retirement. Now, I'm not against retiring. What I am against is making that your goal in life. Your goal ought to be the glory of God. And you can glorify God by retiring. You can glorify God by working. But your goal is the glory of God. Wouldn't it be better if Christians were dramatically different, distinctively different because the Holy Spirit filled us and it changed our hearts, he ordered our lives, and he focused our thinking on what is really important. But because so many Christians are spiritual babes in Christ, we hoard what little remains of our faith in God in an effort to, to convince God that what we need is a more comfortable life. We need more convenience. I mean, this life is really hard. You know what? We need to move past that stage of being a spiritual infant. And we need to mature into that stage where we beg God to do something great in our country. We beg God to do something great in our state of California. We beg God to do something great in Solano County. We beg God to do something great at Elmira Baptist Church. We beg God to do something great in our family. We beg God to do something great in our life that will shake up our community. That's what we need. Now, we've had some people lose family members this past week, and I've been praying for their comfort because that's appropriate. So don't misunderstand. I'm not saying quit praying for each other. Of course we pray for each other. But are we praying that God will be glorified because the Holy Spirit works powerfully through us or are we just praying to be comfortable because life is hard? Too many Christians, too many American Christians, too many American Christians see the Bible as a self-help book. And church is sort of like group therapy. And God is our therapist. He wants us to feel better about ourselves. That's not what the Bible teaches. 
we need a new vision. We, Elmira Baptist Church, as well as other American believers, we need a new vision of who God is. We need a new vision of how holy He is, how majestic God is, how awe-inspiring God is, how good God is, how loving God is, how just, how beautiful, how almighty God is, and yet He's almighty, He's all-powerful, and He's meeting with us right now. Where two or three are gathered in my name, God says, there I am in the midst of them. Now, if I were an all-powerful God, I wouldn't worry too much about this little group of believers. But God cares. God cares how many hairs I have on my head. The Bible says if a bird falls to the ground, God knows it. How much more does he care for us? We need a new vision of who God is and that he's with us all the time. But if we want to prepare our hearts and order our lives and focus our thinking, we're going to have to build in habits of righteousness that lead to consistent victory. We're going to need to develop habits of righteousness that lead to consistent victory. Now, I'm going to talk about some of those habits in a moment. But before I get to those habits, let me talk about, uh, I'm going to call it two axioms and a corollary. Those of you who remember all the way back to your geometry days, an axiom was that thing that you just took for granted. You didn't have to prove it. You could just use it in any proof you needed that particular statement in, and you didn't have to prove that statement. Two, two statements that I hope I don't have to prove today. Number one, that everyone here knows that their sins are forgiven and that you have a home in heaven. Because the Holy Spirit doesn't indwell people who are not believers. And so as we talk about the Holy Spirit and you say, well, I never feel that. I, I never have that. I don't even know who the Holy Spirit is. Your problem is you first need to become a Christian. You first need to become a son of God. Because the Bible says as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. But the second thing I'm going to take for granted, I'm just going to assume, is that everyone here is in love with God. I mean, you love God. We say we ought to love God with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, all our strength. And so I, I'm not saying I've reached that point, but that's what I'm striving for. Because if you don't love God, frankly, you're not going to be interested in his glory. You're not going to be interested in who he is. And I can, you know, get out of figurative, metaphorically, a whip, you know, and make you guys all feel terrible about yourselves. and Make you feel so guilty you're not in love with God and you ought to do more for God. But, you know, I'm not helping you. Because it starts with a love for God. You say, well, how do you know that? Well, because a man came to Jesus while Jesus was here on earth, and he said, okay, what is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus answered, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments, Jesus said, all the other commandments depend. And I'm, I'm paraphrasing. You can read for yourself in Matthew 22. So if you don't love God, again, today's message is not going to, be particularly helpful for you. And the corollary to loving God, if you love God, guess what? You will want to please him, won't you? I mean, if you love God, you want to please him. I'm going to use a, an infantile example, but, but follow me because it's a lot of fun. Do you remember one of your first crushes? Maybe it was in high school. Maybe you were more mature than I was and you didn't have any high school crushes, but you remember your first crush in high school? That young, in my case, young lady, that just seemed like the most beautiful person you'd ever seen in your life. And she had just such a melodious voice. I just wanted to spend every minute of every day with that young lady. I don't remember her name today, but I mean, at that time, it was really important to me. Do you remember that? You just wanted to make that person happy. If she dropped her pen on the floor, you wanted to be the person to pick it up. If she brought some terrible liverwurst sandwich for lunch. You wanted to be the one to say, hey, I, I tell you what, I'll buy you something better. Right? 
Why did you want to please that person? In my case, why did I want to please her so much? Because I thought that that was the person I loved. Now, if we are willing to do that for a high school crush, how much more for a God that we love? We just want to please him. Right. Just want to make him happy. If there's something we can do to serve him, it's not a matter of, well, I guess I have to do this. It's I get to do this. I, I, there, here's a way I can, I can please God. I can make him happy. By the way, don't listen to those people who say nothing you do pleases God. That's not a scriptural statement. Now, there's nothing you can do to earn your salvation. I agree with that. But there's a lot of things, once you're saved, that God expects you to do. And when you do it, it's a, uh, Paul describes it as a sweet-smelling savor to him. And he's happy. Oh, look, he's doing what I asked him to do. She's, she's obeying my commandments. That's great. God is happy to see those things. But because we love him. Now, if we want to prepare our hearts and order our lives and, and focus our thinking, there's something that you need to understand about human character. And, and again, I know this is a long introduction, but I, just, I want to get all these pieces out so that you understand what, where we're going today and understand fully what I'm saying. We like to think that what we need is more motivation. You know, we need that. It probably comes from watching too many movies, right? You got this big, long movie, and at the end of the movie, take a, a sports movie, right? The coach gets everybody in the locker room, and he says some real dramatic thing to them, and they go out, and they win the game. And sometimes we come to church, and we sort of feel like, well, boy, I hope my pastor has a really motivating message today, because I, I just feel so down and so unenergetic. And I just need to get pumped up, so I'm ready to serve God tomorrow. I need more motivation. But frankly, motivation is just smoke and mirrors. A good preacher, and I'm not one, but I've, I've watched them, I've observed some, a good preacher can use motivation like smoke and mirrors and make you think and do things you never thought were possible. But it's just ephemeral. Just, it doesn't last because it's just smoke and mirrors. Real change comes with discipline. Motivation is smoke and mirrors. Discipline is decisive. Now, I don't mean discipline like I come over to your house and I go through, get rid of that. Get, no, no, no. I'm talking about you personally. Building habits of righteousness into your life. So when the Holy Spirit says, okay, I'm ready for you to do this, you're ready to do it. Let me illustrate what I mean. This statistic came to me in the last month. I'd never heard this statistic before, but I looked it up, found out that it's true. More allied soldiers were killed preparing for D-Day than ki were killed on D-Day. They spent over a year, uh, the U.S., Canada, Great Britain, spent over a year preparing to land on the beaches of Normandy. And during those preparations, they used live fire exercises. They were out in the water coming to the beach, and sometimes boats would sink, and, and, and soldiers and sailors would die. At one point, just a, about a week or two before the D-Day landings, with their final, uh, their, their big rehearsal, they got the whole uh, uh, corps together. It was a big group of soldiers, tens of thousands of soldiers, and somehow some German torpedo boats snuck through this net of, of, of screen they had and sunk some of the transport ships. Fortunately, the Germans didn't figure out what they were actually doing. But more soldiers died preparing for D-Day than died on the beaches of Normandy. But that was so important because when those soldiers finally got to the beaches of Normandy, they had disciplined themselves. They had prepared themselves so they knew what to do when real bullets were flying at them. When they came up to the barbed wire and there didn't seem to be a way through, they had been trained how to blast a hole in that barbed wire. When there was a pillbox with a German machine gun up on the hill and he had the best line of sight and he had the best uh, shooting angles, they had learned how to use suppressive fire to keep his shooting down while other soldiers circled around and got behind the pillbox. And it saved literally tens of thousands of lives. It wasn't that Eisenhower got up the night before D-Day and gave this great motivational speech to the soldiers, and so they all got pumped up and they stormed the beaches of Normandy. No, no. In fact, many of them were sick to their stomach. They were seasick as they landed on the beach. 
but their training had taught them what to do to, to make a successful assault. And it's not that we as Christians need more motivation. We have all the motivation we need. Jesus, God's son, came and he died in my place. I don't need any more motivation. I need some habits. I need some discipline that will prepare my heart and order my life and focus my thinking. So, with all that in mind, let's go now to Galatians chapter 5. Let me show you some of those habits, the way of thinking that is going to help us. Galatians chapter 5, verse 13. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty, only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So first thing we're going to do this week, Monday through Saturday, again next Sunday, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to make serving others more important than being served. Serving others more important than being served. Now, let me ask you this question. Uh, Go ahead and raise your hand. Those of you at home, raise your hand if this is true of you. How many of you are breakfast eaters? You enjoy eating breakfast in the morning. Okay, good. Put your hands down. Now, I don't want you to raise your hand for this one. How many of you made breakfast this morning? You see, there's a lot of people in my house that are great breakfast eaters if someone else is making the breakfast. (laughs) But if nobody gets up and makes breakfast, all of a sudden breakfast is not an important meal. You see, because all of us like to be served. I like to be served. I like to be served. I like it when people come to me and say, hey, pastor, what can I do around the church? In fact, I like it even better when someone says, pastor, I notice such and such a part of the church needs to be painted. I'm going to go down. I'm going to spend my own money. I'm going to buy my own paint. I'm going to make sure that gets painted. I just want to know, do you know what color the church uses? And I have a swatch. It's in my office. I'll give it to you. You can paint any part of this church you want. That's great. I love it when I'm served. It's a whole lot harder for me to serve others. But here it says, you've been called into liberty, only use not liberty as an occasion for the flesh, but by love serve one another. If we went through the church today and I said, okay, what's what's your need? What's your need? Some of you would have prayer requests. Uh, Would you pray for this? By the way, don't, don't, don't misunderstand me. I'm not diminishing that, disparaging that. We ought to share our requests. Some of you might have a physical need. You have a Something your house needs to be fixed or something in your car needs to be fixed. Some of you might have a personal need. There's someone in your life you need to be reconciled with. You'd have, there would be needs all over the church. But then if I said, okay, I've got all this list of needs here and here. Now, who can meet this need? That would be a harder thing to fill, wouldn't it? Because we all have things we want done, but we're not usually thinking about how to serve other people. And if we're going to prepare our hearts, and we're going to order our lives, and we're going to focus our minds, we've got to set aside the desire to be served and desire to serve other people. We've got to quit thinking about what we want for breakfast in the morning, and we need to start thinking about how early I have to get up so that everyone at my house gets breakfast. And I'm just using that as an example. If your family doesn't eat breakfast, it's not an unspiritual thing, okay? Serve others rather than being served. Here's the second thing that this passage teaches us we need to do. We must be more concerned with promoting unity than promoting self. We must be more concerned with promoting unity than promoting self. Galatians 5.15, If ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. And what's the reason that they're attacking each other? Well, verse 26 tells us, Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. Now, I I praise God that I don't observe this much at Elmira Baptist Church, but I've been in churches where the big thing is not serving others. The big thing is being seen. Pastor, I want to be the person that gets seen. I want to be the person that gets noticed. Look at all the work that I've done. Nobody ever recognizes me for, and as long as we make myself And being recognized, the big deal, we're not interested in serving. But we have to get to the point where promoting unity among the brethren, among ourselves, is more important than promoting self. Because I don't observe that much, I'm going to move on past that point. But oftentimes, the reason that we struggle to serve others, 
And the reason that we want to promote self is because we are feeding the flesh rather than feeding the spirit. And when you feed the flesh, you can, you can do things that, you can, you can do things that help the church and help others, but it's really hard. I, when I first began shaving, my parents, they were really kind, generous. They got me one of those electric razors, and I used this electric razor for years. And then I, after several years of using this electric razor, I was getting ready to take a trip to Russia. And not just any part of Russia, Kamchatka, the Kamchatka Peninsula. And if the Kamchatka Peninsula is not the most isolated point in the world, you tell me what is. There are no roads, no railroads into Kamchatka. Even though it's connected to Asia by this thin piece of land, that land is dotted with volcanoes and glaciers, and nobody travels on it. If you want to get to Kamchatka, you either fly or you take a boat. So I said to myself, you know, I don't know what the electrical situation is going to be. If this is right after the fall of the Soviet Union, and, you know, do, will they even have electricity? You know what I'll do? I'll just use a regular safety razor. And I'll start shaving with a regular safety razor. So for some weeks before I took my trip, I bought myself a safety razor. I took one from my brother who had one, whatever. Started shaving with a razor. No problem. You know, about a week into my trip, I was there for a couple weeks, shaving became quite painful. Every morning I'd get up and I'd you know, wash my face and I'd start to sh- it, it was like It was like dragging sandpaper over my face. You know what I found out? I had a dull razor. Yeah, I needed to change my razor. Never even thought of it. I'd used an electric razor all my life. Well, you know, change a razor, right? You can shave with a dull razor, but it's painful. And you can serve others in the flesh, but it's, it's painful. Let me tell you what you need to do. You need to change your razor. You need to feed the spirit rather than feed the flesh. Look at the passage right here. It says, this I say then, verse 16, Walk in the spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Verse 17, for the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. You see, in each one of you that is a Christian, remember my two axioms, everyone in here is a Christian. In those of you that are a Christian, you have two sides. You have a civil war going on. A civil war. It, it's, it's not a cat fight. I... We recently got this little kitten, and it's been fun to watch the big cat try to beat up on the little kitten. But the little kitten is just playing, and the big cat really doesn't want to hurt the little cat. We're not talking about a cat fight. We're talking about a civil war going on in your life. On one side, you have the flesh. We also call that the old man. That's the part of you you had before you were a Christian. That's the part that hates God, that hates being submitted to God, that is in rebellion against God. But also, when you became a Christian, guess what? You were baptized into the Spirit. And now the Spirit, notice it's a capital S here, the Spirit lives inside you as well. And these two are diametrically opposed to each other. You think the Republicans and Democrats hate each other. You should see the Spirit in the flesh. I mean, there is no common ground between the Spirit and the flesh. And just about everything you do, if you want to have a discussion, we can, but just about everything you do either feeds the flesh or it feeds the spirit. Now you say, well, how do I know whether I'm feeding the flesh or the spirit? Well, God anticipates that question and he gives us the answer in verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, Variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. You see, if I find myself doing these actions, or if I find myself enjoying watching other people do these actions, then I am feeding the flesh. And guess what? The more I feed the flesh, the more desirable these actions become to me. And it's a, it's a, it's a really a vicious cycle that... You feed the flesh a little bit and and you think that the flesh will be satisfied and he'll sort of quiet down and he'll just leave you alone. He doesn't. He becomes more ravenous. He wants more feeding. But if you feed the Spirit, look at verse 22. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. 
So, so the question is real simple. What are you noticing in your life? If you're noticing the first set, that's because you're feeding the flesh. If you're noticing the second set, that's because you're feeding the spirit. If you say, well, I'm not sure which one it is, you're feeding the flesh, trust me. Because when you're feeding the spirit, you know it. The spirit not only dwells in you, which is true for every Christian, but he fills you. And, and it's, it's just, it, you know it. So how do we feed the flesh? How do we feed the spirit? Now, we could just take days and go through all the various ways that people can feed their flesh. Let me just mention three that I think are very common in American life. Ways that we feed the flesh. Very common in American life. Watch just about anything on a screen. Whether it's your phone, tablet, television, movie theater screen, just about anything you watch on a screen is probably going to feed the flesh. Because that's what sells in American society. Um, this is a long discussion, but, but if we just group all of that as Hollywood and, and, and what do they call those people, the uh, uh, influencers. Hollywood and the influencers, they have one goal. That is to make money. And they realize that what makes money is to draw eyeballs. And what draws eyeballs is not righteousness. Right? Uh, when's the last time you were watching uh, the news program and they said, we break away from the burning of the courthouse in Portland to show you somebody walking an old lady across the street? They don't do that. Now, every once in a while, we have human interest stories and they tell people how you know, people are being nice to each other. But generally, what plays well on screens is things blowing up things burning down, people getting beat up, people committing evil. I mean, that's, that's, what, that's what people, oh, I want to see that. So just about any time you watch a screen, you're going to see adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings. What list did that come from? So just, just I'm just telling you. Any, now, you say, well, let me just, okay, let me help you here, because I, I, I think it was Jesse also mentioned that you, you guys used to, and I, boy, this really idea sat well with me, you used to have these fasts from television, where you take a whole week off. I, but I know if I said, let's all fast from television, some of you say, good thing I watch YouTube on my phone. No, but that's, that's the issue, see. We, we used to be able to just turn off the television and we could be done with it all. There's so many different ways to take this into our eyeballs and take this into our ears and feed the flesh. Okay, number one, what are you watching on a screen? Television, phone, pet tablet, what are you watching? Is it feeding the flesh or is it feeding the spirit? Number two, second way that we often feed the flesh. Listen to just about any channel on the radio, uh, Spotify, Pandora, I ask my daughter, tell me what these places are. Pandora, Apple Music, 99.99% of the music that's produced today is intended to feed the flesh. Now, I, I know this. If you want to discuss it with me, I'd be glad to take you down that road. But they're trying to feed the flesh. Again, why? Because what is the music industry's number one goal? Make money. And the way they make money is to make music that people, that unsaved, unbelieving people like. And do unsaved, unbelieving people like spiritual music? No, they never will. There's nothing you can do to make them like it. Why? Because they have a basic deficiency. They don't have the Holy Spirit. So when I say music that we're making today, I'm just saying, what, what do we want to say, Nashville or, or, or Los Angeles or anywhere in between? It doesn't matter where the music's made. The idea is let's make money. Let's give people what they want. And people like music that, that feeds the flesh. So just about any time you turn on the radio, there, maybe there's a radio station that works around here. It's every, every city ought to have one. But, but typically, if I just go to my phone and I get it out and I say, okay, let me listen to something, whatever service it is, Spotify, Pandora, Apple Music, it's probably going to feed the flesh. And that's why so many of us as Christians, I'm, I'm talking to me, I'm talking to you as Christians, we know what we ought to do, but we can't do it. Because what does it say right here? The flesh lusteth against the spirit, verse 17. The spirit against the flesh, these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. 
You want to do it. I mean, you really do want to do right, but you keep feeding your flesh with music that appeals to your flesh and you can't do what you want. Here's the third thing. And, and there's, like I said, we could take hours and days discussing everyone. If you're the type of person that just says whatever comes to your mind, you are feeding your flesh. Trust me. Proverbs 29, 11 says, A fool uttereth all his mind, but a wise man keepeth it in till afterwards. And if I'm just constantly saying whatever comes to my mind, I am feeding my flesh. Now, I know what we say. Well, that person deserves to hear it. Well, maybe, but you probably aren't the one who deserves to say it. I have learned in my life that I'm much better served by keeping my mouth shut and praying about something. And then the Lord says, no, no, you really ought to say that going back and saying it than just saying whatever comes to my mind and then trying to make up for it later. Because you can always, something you've not said, you can always not say it again later. But once you've said something, how do you unsay it? You hope the person gets dementia. Okay, that's a terrible thing to say. <laughs> Seriously, you can't unsay things. So don't feed the flesh by saying whatever comes to mind. So how do we feed the spirit? And we've taken a long time. I'm going to go real quick through this. This is the Bill Barron's version of this message. How do you feed the spirit? You're going to saturate your soul with scripture. You're going to saturate your soul with scripture. I got to tell this funny story. Caleb, do you remember the time you stayed at the Terrell's house? They sent Caleb. Uh, Caleb was like four years old. Elsie was like two years old. And they sent my two children home. They were such a kind family to put my children up. I really loved them. They sent my two children home with a DVD. And on the DVD was scripture verses and, and God-honoring music. There was no talking. There was just God-honoring music, and then it would show a scripture verse. And my son Caleb said to me, never play that DVD for me again. <laughs> you don't, here's my point, you don't saturate your mind with scripture by watching a television screen. Even if you did have a DVD, and if you want that DVD, I'll try to find it. I'd probably still have it somewhere. I'm a pack rat. Even if you did have a DVD with just scripture words, you would find it very boring to just stare at your television screen and see scripture come up. So you're going to have to train yourself. Again, it's about habits of righteousness. You're going to have to train yourself to read your Bible, to memorize your Bible, to meditate on your Bible. And when I say meditate on, you don't have to memorize it. You can look at a passage and, and think deeply about it with it right in front of your eyes. But you have to saturate your soul with Scripture if you're going to feed the Spirit. Amen. And then secondly, and again, there's a lot of activities we could give you. I just want to give you these two. Be aware of the Holy Spirit's leading in your daily activities. When you get up in the morning, are you aware that the Holy Spirit is going to lead you? Now you say, well, no, because the first thing I do is wash my face. Okay, I get that. We all have a little routine we go through in the morning when we first get up. Maybe it's brush our teeth or whatever. But the Holy Spirit's in that too. Don't misunderstand me. But the Holy Spirit is in the decisions that I make when I get up in the morning. Right. He's in the decisions that I make when I come to my office. I have an office here. Or if I'm at home or if I go out. The Holy Spirit has, is leading me. We, we talked about Romans 8, 14. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. The Holy Spirit is leading you. So if you say to me, well, pastor, that's sort of strange because I never notice the Holy Spirit leading me. There's two possible diagnoses. Number one, you don't have the Holy Spirit. But it's more likely you've quenched the Holy Spirit by keep, you, because you keep telling him, not, not now, not now, not now. Because that's what we tell the Holy Spirit, isn't it? He says, okay, here's your chance to serve your family or serve your friend in such a way. Not now. Not now. I'm busy. Here's your chance to say an encouraging word to someone. You just saw someone do something that was admirable, that deserves to be commended. Not now. Not now. I'm busy. The guy shows up and he's not expected. And the Holy Spirit says, okay, here's your chance to witness to him. Why don't you open the scriptures and, and, and give him the gospel, and you say, not now, not now. And you say, not now long enough, and what does the Holy Spirit do? He says, okay, I'm going to sit here. And when you think you're ready to listen to me, I'm just going to sit here. That's quenching the Holy Spirit. 
And as a Christian, I can do that. I can quench the Holy Spirit. I can grieve the Holy Spirit and make him sit there quiet. But I'm the loser. I'm the loser. God does not need me. He doesn't need you. I'm the loser when I say, not now. Not now. And if I want to feed the Spirit, I need to be acutely aware. I need to be very sensitive to the Holy Spirit saying, okay, here's your chance to say an encouraging word. Okay, here's your chance to serve somebody. Okay, here's your chance to give someone the gospel. And instead of saying, not now, not now, saying, okay, help me. Because that's what the Spirit loves to do. He loves to help you. Okay, help me. Boy, that one's a hard one, Holy Spirit. Help me. And the Holy Spirit leads you. And he empowers you. And you feed the Spirit. And guess what? The next time, the Holy Spirit says, okay, do this. Okay, help me. And the Holy Spirit helps you. And you, are, you become more and more confident that you can be led by the Spirit. So let me ask you this morning, what are you observing in your own life? Are you observing what's in verses 19 through 21? Or are you observing what's in verses 22 and 23? And if you're observing more of what's in 19 through 21, you need to quit feeding the flesh and start feeding the Spirit. And if you're observing what's in 22 and 23, keep feeding the Spirit. Saturate your soul with Scripture and be aware of the Holy Spirit leading in your life. Because really, what revival is, it's a love for God that leads us to renew our dedication to obey Him. And that's when the Holy Spirit says, okay, I've got something for you to do. So I hope each one of you will work this week to starve the flesh and to feed the Spirit. Father in heaven, thank you again for your word that makes things clear to us because we are, we are people who like the darkness. We like that veil over our eyes so that we can't see clearly. And we can claim plausible deniability that we didn't really know what you wanted us to do. We weren't really sure. Father, forgive us for that. I know what you want me to do. I know what you want many of my brothers and sisters to do and others I don't know exactly what you want them to do, but I'm confident that you have a plan and a purpose for their life. So I ask that you would help us to recognize this week when we're feeding the flesh and starve it. And to recognize when we can feed the Spirit and feed the Spirit so that we prepare our hearts for revival, we order our lives for revival, we focus our thinking on revival, and you're glorified regardless of our circumstances. And regardless of our circumstances, we're prepared for revival. And regardless of whether Jesus is coming today or in a hundred years, we'll be ready because we've ordered our steps, we prepared our hearts, and we focused our thinking. We pray this because we, 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 as Americans, we desperately need you to intervene in the lives of your people all across the United States. From San Diego to Bangor, and from Key West to Bellingham, Washington, Father, we need an outpouring of your Holy Spirit that we've not seen in a long time. If we're going to avoid the anarchy and the chaos that the enemy has planned for us. So we ask, Father, that in your mercy and your grace and your goodness and your love, that you would pour out your Holy Spirit upon me, upon us, upon Elmira Baptist Church and across the United States. And then you will be exalted. Your word will be honored. You will be praised. And that's why we pray these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please stand with